Welcome, church family, to uh, worship this morning. And for those of you that are here in the sanctuary and those that are joining us online, we once again welcome you all. We're going to begin as we normally do with a couple songs and hear the word preached and have communion and leave the sanctuary in a time of song again as well. But uh, in my, uh, if you will, devotion study time this morning, this came up and I'll share it with you. It's from Ephesians. And it's the prayer for spiritual strength. Paul begins here with, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend all or with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So church family, those of you that are able in here, if you want to stand with us, we're going to go with that spiritual prayer and all that God can give us in this place, not only to deal with our common lives as we come here, but what he's asking us to do, you and I, to be a part of his kingdom. We're going to begin with that familiar song, if you will, of the doxology. What gift of love could I offer to a king? What weight or worth could be held within my offering? When he alone is worthy. A glory song Treasure held in an alabaster jar, I pray to bring him all the glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Give from above the faith. 
praise you and we honor you in this place, Father God, for all that you are and all that you mean to us. May our hearts and our desires align with the desires of your heart. May the will and the destiny that you've placed upon us, Father, be for, come to fruition in this place and that we may learn and to be about your business. Father, we desperately need you in a time such as this. Not that this point seems to be any different than any point in the past, Father, but it just seems like more and more and more of the, your people and those on the outside need to bow a knee. Continue to fill us with your spirit and your spiritual gifts. And help us to have clarity, Father, in all that you are in us. For the desires of our heart need to align with yours. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. Amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that brought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. Come on, God. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so Everyone, God. God, you're 
Good morning, everyone. It's good to be worshiping with you in person or online today. Um, a reminder, if you have a prayer concern or a praise, um, something to celebrate, unspoken request, write it on that prayer sheet, put it in the offering plate uh, out in the narthex, and the staff and elders will be praying about that throughout the week. Um, we had two Bible studies start on Tuesday of last week. They'll be continuing the precept study and the men's Bible study. Uh, the other Bible study, that's a Tuesday morning study, will be kicking in in October. And then my online class begins tomorrow. Um, so if anybody's interested in joining that Facebook Bible study group, um, I'll help you figure out how to do that if you haven't already. Um, I can send you an invite. And then you can access it anytime. Um, I put it on, hopefully, Mondays at 9 a.m. Uh, sometime, occasionally, it's a little different than that, but most of the time that's when it's put on. And then you can access it any time the rest of that day or forever. So um, hopefully you'll be joining us in that. It's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of um, uh, Letter of Jude. Great banquet gathering tonight at 5.30 p.m. right here. Um, you don't have to have gone through a banquet or an awakening to attend. And so um, if you're thinking, know someone who might be interested in exploring that, that might be a great introduction to the Great Banquet or Awakening community. Um, we'll be here for worship, but we won't be doing food for a while because of COVID-19. So we hope that you'll come. Also, uh, Monday night at 7, the worship team is meeting, worship committee. Uh, be aware of that. We've got things to plan. Also, we're still in need of some help cleaning between services. We have three or four people that do it on a regular basis. Um, but we kind of would like to create a second team so they don't have to do it every single week. So if any of you are interested in helping with that, see me after church. Some uh, pastoral care um, situations. Marjorie Buell, uh, most of you are aware, recently had foot surgery. They have to redo that surgery, and that's going to be this coming Thursday. So pray for her and Craig in that process. Shirley Mikesell um, fell and broke a hip. She is now in Montpelier Rehab. Can't have any visitors, um, but she certainly can have prayer and cards and things like that. So be aware of that. And also, um, I found out at the end of second service last week, and this has been out on the church prayer chain, is Jerry Spangler, uh, who attends second service, has stage four prostate cancer. So keep Jerry and family um, in your prayers as they walk that walk. Um, so, Beth. So we will now move into a time of prayer. 
So if you would please join me. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, it's a beautiful day, and we thank you for that. It's a new day. It's a new opportunity that you've given us to be your hands and your feet and your voice. And we pray, Father, that you will guide and direct us as you would have us live out this day and all the days coming forward. Father, may your spirit fill this place. May it touch our hearts. May it reach out beyond these walls to those who are also joining us online. Father, you are an awesome God. You are so good to us. And we thank you for those many, many blessings each and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 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 And Father, we lift up those prayers that are also unspoken this morning that are in our hearts and ask you to listen to those and petition you for those as well. Father, be with Barry this morning and in the coming weeks as he brings us his final thoughts. Um, and as he does so, Father, prepare this congregation and this church for the transition that will take place in the coming months. Father, we seek your will and your direction and your guidance in that process. 
And right now, Father, just um, clear our minds and open our hearts and allow the words to touch us and to move us in a way that will move us closer to you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, if it wasn't evident to you before, um, after all that prayer and all those references to my leaving, um, <laughs> including my own, um, that's kind of where we're heading the next few months in terms of working through some thoughts related to my retirement and um, where God's taking us. And it, um, I was drawn, I'm, I've been praying to God for a long time, what do you want me to say? these last few months, and it kept pulling me back to the letter to the people of Philippi. And uh, all of these sermons grow out of that letter. And I think one of the reasons that God's drawn me to that is because it's obvious when you read the letter to the people of Philippi how much Paul loved those people and loved that church. He had a deep and caring and close relationship with that church and those people, and frankly, I feel the same way about this place. Um, and just as Paul's words in this letter were words from the heart to people he loved and appreciated, so are my words um, that are coming these next 10 or 12 weeks. But I'm struck at the same time by how contemporary and timely these words from Paul are. Of course, Scripture always works out that way, doesn't it? If you really get into Scripture, you realize that it may have been written 2,000 years ago or more, but it's relevant and right on for today. Um, and these words from Philippians speak to our time and our situation and where we are. So I want to start today in this series and these thoughts from Paul from Philippians 1. 12 through 14, and 20 and 21. And these are from the message. Um, at this point, Paul is in prison in Rome for who knows how many times he's been in prison. He's been in and out of prison all the time um, for the gospel. And this is what he writes this time. This is getting towards the end of his ministry and his life, to be very honest with you. And this is what he writes. I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite of its intended effect. Instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. All the soldiers here and everyone else too found out that I'm in jail because of this Messiah. Well, this piqued their curiosity. And now they've learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the followers of Jesus here have become far uh, more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God and about the Messiah. And then further down, Paul writes, Everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or I die. They didn't shut me up, they gave me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger, dead, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life, I can't lose. I love that attitude. Again, Paul's in prison for doing God's work, for preaching the word. So one of the messages there that that sends to me is sometimes doing the work of God is absolutely unsafe. And it can be downright dangerous and costly at times but we still need to do it. You know, many would think that being thrown in prison would pour kind of freezing cold water on the gospel and, and shut down the work of any preacher. Yet just the opposite was happening. As Paul put it, instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. More people are learning about the Messiah Jesus than before Paul was imprisoned. Paul also says, that didn't shut me up. Gave me a pulpit. 
In other words, God has used Paul's imprisonment for great good. Paul was reaching more people from prison than he was as a free man. People who might never be reached if he focused just on the local church crowd are now hearing the gospel and finding Jesus as Savior, Lord, and life leader. God has always found a way to bring good out of bad. Crisis to us is never crisis to God. Let me say that again because it's incredibly important we get this. Crisis to us is never a crisis to God. I personally am a believer that crisis brings opportunity every single time. Albert Einstein once said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Every crisis, while awful and unusually difficult, nobody's going to deny that, crisis is always hard, also gives us an opportunity to be the church, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be loving, to help someone else, to grow, to be Jesus' hands and feet and mouthpiece, to change a life and to change the world. In the early days of the coronavirus, when the church had, you know, we shut down churches, we've been online, uh, we hadn't been having face-to-face -face worship for quite a while, many people were bemoaning the fact how awful it had been and how the church had been shut down and rendered useless and limited. As I look back on that, nothing could be further from the truth. We had to learn to do ministry in entirely new ways, and for this guy who's in his last few months of doing ministry, I had to learn to do it all over again. But that's been good for me. We've had to learn how to do ministry in entirely new ways, but ministry hasn't stopped. And in many ways, it's expanded. One of the amazing ways that God has used online worship for great good is that hundreds more people, and I'm underlining hundreds more people, have been exposed to the gospel because we had to go online. Two examples. On Good Friday, Bryan Area Ministerial Association provided worship online. Normally, we're face-to-face -face in one of our churches, and we might get 100 to 150 people on, at lunchtime on, a fr on Good Friday. This past Good Friday... We were online, not face-to-face, -face, and there were over 1,100 views of that service. 1,100 views. For Easter, if we were here face-to-face, -face, we weren't able to do Easter face-to-face, -face, probably would have seen 150 to 180 in the pews, yet this church alone had over 600 views on Easter Sunday, and we continually... We can go as low as 75, I think I've seen, and as high as... Three, four hundred on a Sunday. Talk about God using a bad situation for good. We're reaching more people online than we ever could face to face. And we're reaching them when they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ more than ever. I saw a quote by an unknown author that stated, with church doors shutting across America, this was early in the coronavirus, it's time for us to show the world that the church has never been about the building." We are the church, and the church has mobilized, gone out into the world where it needs to be. Amen to that. I believe God's been moving in the time of this virus, and God is having his church and his people and his gospel impact many who would not normally be impacted or touched. One of my favorite verses from the Gospel of John is also one of the most challenging of all biblical verses, I believe comes from John 14, verse 12, and this is the NIV version. Jesus is speaking here, and I want you to really think about the implications of these words. Very truly, I tell you, <clears throat> whoever believes in me will do the works I am doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Think about who's speaking here. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, God himself, is telling us we're going to do what Jesus did, what God did through Jesus, and even greater things. I've had a hard time wrapping my brain around that reality. 
The idea that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ will do what he did, and even more than that, we're going to do greater things than Jesus did. How is that even possible? How can you do greater things than Jesus did? <coughs> well, first of all, we have to recognize that God is doing it, not us, but he's choosing to do it through us. So whatever we're doing, God's still doing it, but he's doing it through us. Secondly, I think, anyways, that I believe Jesus is referring to spreading the good news beyond Israel and the Middle East to the whole world. That takes it beyond where Jesus took it. I also think Jesus may be referring to modern ways of sharing the gospel through books and TV and media and film, the internet and beyond, because God is using these things to further his kingdom. God used Paul's imprisonment to spread the gospel to new people in new ways. God is using the coronavirus to take the gospel to new people through technology and the internet and other creative ways to do ministry. The virus forced the church, God's people, to innovate and be creative. I don't know what forced me to do that. I never taught a Bible study course online before. We've used Zoom for meetings when we can't be face-to-face. -face. And I already referenced online worship reaching more people than we ever could face-to-face. -face. So in some ways, the coronavirus, some ways, the coronavirus is a huge opportunity for God's people to innovate. New ways to reach people all in Jesus' name, but we've got to want to innovate, and we have to continue to want to spread the gospel in this time. Harold Herring writes, the storms of life have a way of showing just how big our God is. And he encourages and delivers us victory every time. He also writes, Harold Herring also writes, the question is not whether or not you'll face a crisis, but rather how you will respond to it. You're going to face crisis. All of us will. How are we going to respond to it? Crisis will come to all guaranteed. There ain't any way around that one. As much as we would like to avoid it, it's not possible. And some crises are gigantic and worldwide, like the coronavirus. Others are not as global. But crisis will come to all. The issue is, how do we respond to it? What's our attitude towards it? Whether we see it as opportunity or negatively as the end of what we know. You know, Paul could have responded to being imprisoned with, Woe is me. My ministry is over. I'm done. Look at how this has ended. No good can come from this. He absolutely could have responded that way. But instead he responds with, instead of being squelched, the message has prospered. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. I can't lose. I love that attitude. What a difference in perspective. And what a difference in outcome. When challenges and crises and difficulties come, as they will, Will the church mobilize, look for opportunity, do ministry, or will it freeze and hide and cower and go to sleep? In this day and age of COVID-19, it's challenging to do ministry, there's no question, and to do it safely. Lots of ways the church has been creative and mobilized and found new ways to do the work of God in a challenging time. Other pieces to the church have kind of fallen away, and, and some things have to fall away for safety issues. But how can we do those in new ways? Or maybe something new needs to take its place for a while. I don't know the answers to that, but I do know that ministry needs to continue in some form. So in the days ahead, when I retire and you're between pastors, will you be creative and mobilize, look for ways to do the work of God, or will you freeze and hide and cower and go asleep, or just wait? 
even though real ministry is still needed to be done. Look for ways to do that in this time. Paul exhorts the church. Paul exhorts you and me to mobilize, to get creative, to think outside the box, to keep doing ministry and the work of Christ even in challenging times, and I'm going to say it especially in challenging times. I am so glad this church kept the free meal going. There were challenges right off the bat that a lot of people struggled with it. And how do we do it safely? We had to deal with that issue as well. If you're going to do ministry, you have to try and do it safely. But some, there's some risk no matter what you do. Think about Paul. He was in and out of prison every five minutes. There was risk involved. And we have to do it as safely as we can. But I don't think we can stop doing ministry. I believe God's on the move in all situations. With Paul in prison, with the church doing ministry in the time of the coronavirus, even in the interim between pastors, which begins this December. God has already done amazing things in this time of isolation and illness. I am fully convinced that God will do amazing things at First Presbyterian Church of Bryan, Ohio, after I'm gone. God's got it all worked out. We need to trust him. We need to do our part. We need to engage and get involved. We need to keep doing ministry in the Lord's name. And God will bless your socks off. In Jesus' name. Amen. Every time we celebrate communion, we celebrate the presence of Jesus Christ. It's about forgiveness, it's about second chances and new beginnings, and that's often our focus. But to me today, communion is about communing and God being with us. So the bread and the juice represent Christ's presence with us in crisis, in, tra in change, in transformation, in transition, in the stuff going on in our lives. God wants to be with us. My question to you as you take communion today, how are you letting God in to those times in your lives? Letting him share your transitions, letting him share those moments of change, letting God share um, your heart when you're struggling or when you're celebrating. Are you letting God in? to walk with you, and even sometimes to carry you. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he blessed it and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood which is given for the remission of sin, whenever you drink of it. Remember me. Remember that I am with you. Sometimes I carry you. Sometimes I push you. Sometimes I hold you. Sometimes I listen to you. Fill in the blank. But he's present with us. That's part of communion. God communing with us and us communing with God. And right now, don't we need that really bad? So enjoy his presence this day in your life.
for each and every one of you. Um, if you want to stand with us, we're going to conclude today's service with Waymaker. And how God dovetails all of the different things together with the message and our time of ending this service here. As we go through the song, Brothers and sisters, allow it to minister to you as the Spirit leads. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.
Gracious God, use us, fill us with yourself, take us to new places, deepen us, and help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop. Never stop working, even when I don't see it. You're working, even when I don't feel it. You're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Friends, as we go forth from this service and this time. Crisis is never crisis to God. It may be to us, but it will never be to God. And God can always be found in the midst of the maelstrom somewhere. That's good news. The hard news is that he calls us to go with him into the maelstrom sometimes. He calls us as his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece to do some hard things sometime. But we don't do it alone, ever. Ever, 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 we don't ever do it alone. We do it on his strength and his ability and his protection. Yeah, it landed Paul in prison right and left. And it eventually cost him his life. It may cost us too. But that's part of being faithful. That's the hard news of the gospel that people don't want to hear that often doesn't get preached. It still needs to be preached. Truth needs to be told. And we need to rise up and engage. Don't fall asleep. Engage. In Jesus' name. Amen.